channel. It's your boy, the mortgage loan legend. This is a professional with 25 years of mortgage experience. Here you will find useful information, tips, and advice on how to navigate the complex world of mortgage industry. I'm here to provide insights to help change your perspective so that you turn your losses into wins. Whether you're a seasoned vet or a novice, my content will help you grow, not only as a person, but in whatever industry. All right, so today we've got our good buddy, John Carlos. John Carlos is, uh, well, let me just not tell you who he is. I'm very thankful to have him today on as a guest. And so my friend, um, John Carlos, go ahead and give us a little bit of background. Who, who are you? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm John Carlos Quinones. My full name actually is John Carlos Quinones Belladon. That's my full entire name, kind of loan. I'm a loan officer with Nexa Mortgage. I joined back in November, 2022. I came from retail. I was an underwriter for Wells Fargo for many, many years. Um, before that, I was a, a mortgage auditor as well. Um, so I have almost you know, 13 years of experience. I also was a CFA Charter Financial Analyst candidate for level one. Um, um, before that, I always been involved into the mortgage industry and i'm so passionate right now that i'm in a, i'm a loan officer and i'm you know putting all my knowledge from all these years you know uh out there in order to serve more people man i love it um so i always have to ask this question with anyone who came in to wanting to be a mortgage loan officer when the rates were i wouldn't say historically high but over since 09 uh it pretty much bumped up double and triple what you could have sold uh, 2021 and, and under. What were your thoughts, man? What, what did you make the switch? You know, I made the switch for because I wanted to have a bigger impact on people, Walter, and I'm always trying to grow and uh, have more responsibility and getting more knowledge. It's like uh, every day, you know, I'm trying to learn more and more. Uh, when I was in the, in the underwriting side, you know, I was just... Uh, Yes, a part of the transaction was just a small, you know, I was part of that particular stage that is crucial for the transaction. But I always wanted to be the one structuring everything from the beginning, preparing everything for underwriting and also closing the files and being able to, to provide top service. And also I was always amazed by the way that the whole pricing system works. I'm always amazed about, you know, how the, you know, the basis points play a big role, you know, when you're trying to, to minimize the, the price, when you're trying to add some price to reduce the rate and things like that. So all of that always amazed me. And that's the reason why I made the switch. Um, and I also felt like there was a huge need for a uh, loan officer who speak Spanish in my area. So I'm glad that I make the move. Uh, that's 50% uh, of the business that I work with are definitely international people, people who speak Spanish or Portuguese. Oh, okay. Oh, so you speak Portuguese too, huh? A little broken, but it's, it's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. Okay. So kind of similar to me. So I kind of, when I started, I was in retail uh, back, back, back in the day uh, where everything was on paper. And so when I started, uh, my plan was, okay, I'm going to work at this place for four years, treat it like college, get a good, uh, strong foundation of mortgage, and then go to the broker side where the money was going to be made. Um, those four years turned into eight, um, and I felt that I was, like, stale and stagnant. Like, I couldn't... I guess I could have tried to ride the corporate ladder. I was at a very, very big bank um, and was there for quite some time. Um, but I, I don't know. I just, I was just felt real stale in my place. Is that kind of similar how you felt? Absolutely. And yeah, yeah felt the same way. Every year I was, uh, you know, incorporated. There is always this scale from one to four, mm -hmm. being four is exceptional. Right. I was exceptional every year, but I was in the same place and I was, I couldn't get in, you know, for some reason I could, I couldn't continue growing and that kind of creates some frustration. And I love working for myself now because all the results are because of the, the work that I put into. That's right. Uh, for That's every right. transaction. 
Yeah, man. And that's, uh, and we're going to get into that too, the, the work ethic, right. And things that it takes. Um, you know, I teach a lot of uh, students um, and talk with a lot of people. And one of the things that I, I think I, I really try to hone in on um, is really kind of looking at yourself and what you're doing. Uh, one of the classes I taught last week, uh, I know probably was a little rough, but I'm very passionate because I, I really want to get that truth out. Um, you know, stop working, you know, nine to two in golfing or doing whatever. Get your ass out there. Go talk to realtors, man. Do it. Go mix with the people, you know, and a lot of people that don't make it in this industry end up wanting to point fingers um, other places, but didn't really give it 100%. So it sounds like you're giving it 100%. And I love that, man. And I know you're doing business. So that's business is out there. A lot of people think it's not. And it's more of an excuse uh, not to get themselves out there to go get it. So good for you. Good for you, John Carlos. Absolutely, Walter. That, I, I, I'm putting 100% all, all the way in. That's right. That's right. Um, so for you, where'd you grow up, my friend? Where, where, I know you're in Texas now, is that correct? Yes. So I have a, quite of a history of oh, the places go. that I've been. But, yeah, I love uh, to hear it. Well, I grew up and I'm originally from Lima, Peru. Okay. Um, I actually attended college uh, over there in Peru. I got my bachelor's in marketing. And then I have my own business too after college. And my dad was in the military. He was a colonel uh, in the military. Um, and then in he Peru? became in Peru, yes. Nice. And then he was this person that I always admire. He was also an advisor to the president at some point after he got retired from the military. Wow. And I remember my dad was always so amazed by the US, right? He always talked so beautifully about how the U.S. is the best country in the world. And I'd say that, you know, someday I would like to study my master's over there. But my dad said, well, you don't know any English. I say, I know, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to take some months. I'm going to study 100 percent. Like if I if I have to do five hours a day every day for the next eight months, I'm going to do it. So the next week after having that conversation, I signed up for the British Institute and I studied for eight months and I passed the test and I started applying for American universities. I got accepted on a couple and then I came to Iowa, University of Northern Iowa. I came and then I have to take another test, which was the GRE. I passed the GRE. I started my master's. I finished my master's. I finished my thesis. And then with my Korean fiance, we moved to Texas. She needed to study her, uh, her master's in speech pathologies and then we moved to San Antonio and I started working for Wachovia and then Wachovia became Wells Fargo. And that has been my history, uh, Walter. So it's been a long road and full of challenges and a lot of time on my own and, and, uh, and you know, different obstacles on the way, tests and things like if I didn't pass, you know, the whole thing will stop. But I love those challenges, you know, and, uh, and now I'm here. That's where I am. <laughs> Man, I love that. Um, that says, you know, a lot about who you are. Um, you know, the fact that you're able to take an idea and turn it into reality and really do the work um, to get what you want, because nine out, nine out of 10 people just would quit, right? It's too frustrating. I just can't do this, make all of these excuses. But you found a way how to push and get beyond that limit. What, what, what drives you? Are you just naturally that way? Like, what, what drives you to go get what you want? I honestly, Walter, I think number one is definitely my faith. I'm a, I'm a big dreamer, and I always, um, you know, when I read, uh, I love the story of Joseph in the Bible, mm -hmm. who was one of, he was one of three brothers, who also. Who was sold into slavery by his brothers mm -hmm. and then you know he went through a lot of challenges and at the end you know god had a purpose for him and made him the second in egypt you know he accomplished a lot and uh, you know reached you know really high high goals i love that story because you know it, it for some reason for some reason it's just i love to read it 
and see the power of, of God, how when he has a bigger purpose for you, it will take you to the places, to places that you cannot even imagine, right? Number one, my faith. Number two, I grew up seeing my father, Walter, being number one on everything. He will sit at the table. He was a civil engineer who assimilated to the military. And then, you know, he continued escalating the ranks. But he was number one on everything. And he was admired. He was a person that uh, you know, we'll give speeches in the front of a lot of people. And I always see him like preparing a lot, sitting on the table, studying for an entire nine, you know, for, for the entire night from like no sleep. And, and I remember doing those, even that, you know, uh, when I was studying English to pass the TOEFL exam or to pass the GRE exam before starting my master's degree and things like that. So those two things really is what makes me, I, I, I grew up watching all, you know, my dad and also my faith. So those two factors are super strong in me. Yeah, I, man, that's, that's good. So you, I would say that at a very young age, you had a role model that you looked up to. And instead of telling you what to do, he, he probably guided you, of course, but he showed you. And that was, uh, you know, you saw that and you're like, okay, I can do those things. And then, of course, your faith, you, everyone's got to believe whether it's not, uh, you know, necessarily in God or whatever it may be. You got to believe um, that that power of belief is extremely important. Um, yes. Belief that you can overcome, believe that you can do anything I, without that. I mean, you're, you'll never make it. So, yeah, I love that, man. And, and listen, I'm, this is very interesting. I, I love to hear it. Now, I want to know, though, I, I got to ask, where did Portuguese come into that? Where, where did this Portuguese come from? Well, uh, Peru, you know, is right next to Brazil. And uh, I grew up by the ocean. So, you know, I used to surf pretty much all the time. <laughs> oh, okay. And I was a really good surfer, by the way. <laughs> I really like really big waves and things right. like that. So Brazil doesn't have really good waves. So a lot of Brazilians used to come to Peru to surf the Pacific. Um, that's how I started making friends. And at some point, you know, I started getting more interested in the language because it was a little frustrating, you know, trying to communicate with them, even though the languages are similar, but different in many ways. So I was able to, to learn at some point and come and start communicating well with them. And just because, you know, there were a lot of them and they were, we, you know, I met really good people from Brazil and they became really good friends. So nice. and one or two, you know, girlfriends too. So. <laughs> that a boy. <laughs> yes, I'll make you learn faster. <laughs> nice. I love that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah I would never sure. have thought... Um, I grew up in California and yeah, we used to surf a lot, but it was, it's a lot different. Uh, people from Mexico weren't coming up because, you know, they had their, their beaches down there. So that's, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. That's, that's real cool. Um, so um, how are you part of any type of groups, any type of uh, social groups, any type of, you know, Facebook groups, like, like where, when you, when you need someone to lean on after hours, like what, what, what do you have? What, what, what's your support group? So the person that brought me to Nexa, uh, her name is Alejandra. Um, and, you know, it is her and there are some two or three other loan officers within that group. And we have an office very much in the heart of the real estate world here in San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this small group of us, we don't, we don't really have a Facebook group. It's just, we have a text group and I mean, everybody's so supportive from each other. You know, I noticed that there are a lot of other people in the industry, you know, for some reason, I just, I, you know, sometimes to just kind of not trust everybody, right. but I start feeling really comfortable with, with, with them. And I, I feel like they are feel comfortable with me when they come to to trust about going through difficult times and sharing about their day and so we've been kind of supporting each other Walter when it comes to you know if you have a bad day I'll call and they already know you know and they will be there you know and and at the end of the day it wasn't just about 
sharing and, you know, complain, not complaining, but I mean, just sharing my bad day, but it was about finding a strategies. Okay, so what could I have done better here? Right. So and then what would you think I should have done better? And, don't, and they will share, right? Oh, you should have done this, this, and that. So in that way, you wouldn't have run into these issues. You're absolutely right. And then when they go through difficult times, so that they will ask me, you know, what would I have done differently? And I will tell them, you know, you know, basically when you tell me, you no, know, you should have done this, this, and that, and I think that will have been a good strategy that would allow you to close on time and don't run into problems. And that's how the conversation ends with a constructive criticism and ideas and strategies of things that we could have done differently to have a better outcome, you know? Yeah. yeah so, like that. So yeah, that's the support group that we that I currently have, Walter. And for you, um, in your group, are there any seasoned people? Like obviously, you have underwriting uh, credentials, but any seasoned loan officers in that group? Yes. So two of the of the ladies, uh, Alejandra, you know, is one. She's been doing it for quite some time, and then there is another girl. Her name is Toya, and she's been doing it for over fourteen years too. And uh, they're really seasoned. Uh, they're good. I mean, they both of them, every time that I'm like, you know, I have a little, like, for example, you know, I have a closing on Monday and the repairs on this FHA won't be done until Thursday. Mm -hmm. So I never went through this, right? So I asked one of them, okay, well, should I order the inspection now? Should I wait a little bit until the repairs are totally done to make sure, say, and they say, well, order now, schedule for Friday and try to have everything ready to go and see if you can find on Monday. And I talked to the AE, well, okay, so are we gonna be able to close on Monday? She said, well, let's try to get everything ready and don't postpone the closing it until the very, very last minute. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I you know, try to get advice from everybody to try to make sure that those pieces fall into line to be able to, to pull this off, right? And at the end of the day, um, I think we're gonna be able to close on Monday just fine. Well, and I like to throw in my little two piece uh, on that as well. So whenever, so here, here's the thing. Um, as soon as you have a finalized date, you 100% want to order the reinspection because when you order the reinspection, that just simply lets the appraiser know that it's back on their docket to go back out and to reinspect. Now, yeah. in order for that appraiser to go, they should always call and it'll always be the listing agent call to make sure, hey, is the work done or do I have access to the property? So at that point, if it is a pushback till Friday, right, then the, the realtor and the appraiser can also talk to where they can reschedule it for that time. And then the appraiser should put a note into their portal, letting you know that they've changed the schedule or that they're in talks with the listing agent. Okay, that's the first part. Awesome. The, sec the second part that I would tell you is as soon as you know that there's issues with the appraisal and that you need to get uh, the inspector back out, obviously the listing agent knows because they talk to the seller in order yeah. to do all of the things. So here's, here's where we got to set proper expectations with everyone involved. I'm mm -hmm. personally going to have a conversation with my listing agent and say, hey, listen, we know that we've got to close right now currently on Monday. However, with the reinspection, appraisers could take anywhere between 24 to 48 hours in business time to get that report back. Then, as you know, the lender has to review to make sure everything was done in a workmanlike manner, um, especially on FHA. They could be asking for invoices. And I mean, underwriters, as you know, uh, my friend, can get pretty uh, clever when it, when it comes to signing off on, on work that's done on a property, especially for FHA, because FHA is very strict with, their, with the, the property guidelines that they want to see. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm getting all parties involved, letting them know it is very possible that we need an extension, but here's the exact reason. So I'm educating everyone. Right. So, so just because uh, part of what I believe I heard you say was, I'm just going to, your AE is telling you to wait till the end. First of all, don't, don't, you try not to get advice on loans from an AE. Um, an AE is literally a salesman to salesman. So, hey, come use my products. Everything's going to be okay. And I promise you, 
anything wrong goes with the loan, your AE won't be around. And if they are, right. they don't have enough power to make things kind of happen for you, you know? So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I would just let them know, hey, listen, we're still shooting for a Monday close, but um, please keep in mind, it's the appraiser doing the report, getting it to the lender, the lender reviewing, signing off on the report. Um, and then at that point, you can get to closing. And of course, depending on your lender, some lenders take 48 hours before they get docs out. Right, so, exactly. So just be careful, but that's just some a little bit of advice from me. Um, and it just gives me, because, you know, realtors love, the, even when it goes bad, just tell me what's up. Um, I can tell yes. you nine out of 10 realtors, especially the listing agent, for those that are listening, the listing agent is always the person that is not given any information. Okay. Um, what we do is we'll give a standard uh, loan service agreement um, uh, to a, a loan st a status update form um, to just the buying agent, uh, but we're not going to be giving that to the listing agent. We don't call the listing agent to ask them for their business. We don't call the listing agent, hey, just so you know, boom, 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 I'm doing this. We're always expecting the buying agent to be that, that communication part. And a lot of, especially newer LOs don't know, those listing agents aren't getting any information. So if anything does happen and you need an extension, well, of course you gotta get it from the listing agent, but the listing agent's like, I haven't heard from you guys in 30 days. I have no confidence that this loan is gonna get funded. Um, exactly. So yep. yeah, for those of you guys listening, uh, Listing agent is a perfect way to double your realtor business because you're already working with a realtor. Now you can be working with two. Now you'll be working with three, right? And communication. That's a, that's a great point, Walter. Uh, see, those, 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 are, those are one of those pieces, right? That was never part of retail that you get from the streets, right? Right. Per se. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And now you double your, uh, your reach when it comes to future referrals. That's right. And it's just like this. Um, when you were an underwriter, I'm sure that there were several names that came across your desk with, you knew the loan wasn't going to be complete. You knew it was going to be a laundry list of 20 conditions uh, that yeah. you were going to be handing out. But then you also saw, I'm sure, names on files where you're like, oh, I'm already assuming that this is super clean. Um, yes. It's the exact same thing when you're dealing with a realtor, when you're dealing with the processor. If you have the reputation of being thorough and communicating, even if they're already working with another partner, you are going to be in their back of their mind because they understand you're a true professional. So, uh, you know, communicate as much as you can for all those out there. Um, awesome. So, my friend, let me ask you, um, so do you currently have realtor partners? So I know your office is in the middle of a very big real estate hub. Are you guys like working as a team and and tackling them all together? Like, like, what are you guys doing? What's your team doing? We're, we're not tackling us together as, as you might think. Uh, we're very independent. Um, so, and, and that's not because that's the way kind of that they want to do it. Uh, sure. So I've been, I've been independent myself. I currently working with two agents that are, they send me very much everything. Um, so there are and that is people that I'm building on, you know, people that I'm becoming not just a business partner, but also a, a friend, uh, somebody I'm, you know, we don't only talk about business, but also we talk about our families and we do things together and I'm supporting, you know, them in different ways, right? Open houses and if they need flyers, I'll do the flyers for them. And they are so grateful, you know, and they send me business. Um, that's a good thing. I mean, not every uh, referral is going to be good, but I always disposition every single thing they send me, you know, um, and that's a good thing. Yeah, no, for sure. And a lot of, um, so part, a large, huge part of what we do here on the podcast is <clears throat> we want to change people's perspective and mindset. And a lot of people think, well, rates are high. Uh, there's no inventory in the market. Um, I don't have business cards. I'm new, right? They have all of these these thoughts in their head that actually have nothing to do with gaining realtor partners. See, at the yeah. end of the day, um, John Carlos, and we've talked about this before, it's a human experience. 
So yes. those partners that you have by building a relationship and becoming friends with them, I'm sure it's number one, organic. Um, and then number two is that is where all the trust begins. Because even if, here's the thing, we all know, and you especially as being a loan uh, uh, an underwriter for so many years, things always are going to go wrong. You should always plan for things to go wrong. I don't care if you have an easy social security pension income loan, something is going to go wrong. And so um, when you have a strong partner that likes you and that you, you know, you do more than just, Hey, can I call your realtor list? Can I do these things? You now have a relationship to where it's a true partnership to where, Hey, listen, Hey partner, here's the situation. How are we going to tackle this together? How are Mm -hmm. we going to get the extension? How are we, hey, maybe I should call this time because maybe they don't like you, right? Maybe I call and do my thing. And that is a partnership that will always last because you got each other's back. And every time you have each other's back, guess what? That trust goes up and up and up and up. And then when they're out there talking to realtors, guess whose name they're dropping? It's yours. So for the listeners out there, Please know it is not a transactional partnership. This is a, a friendship. This is something, have a barbecue, invite them, hang out, have a beer, go to the happy hour, um, talk to them about family, talk to them about your problems. You must build a strong relationship for it to last. So um, I love that. Man, John Carlos, you're doing all the right things, man. As a newer LO, I am have to say, I think your group is definitely putting you on the right place. Um, I would be partnering up if I were you. Um, you guys are in the hub of this whole area. And so I literally would, uh, me personally, I'd be like, okay, what's everyone's strong suits? And then I would take us all to go tackle each office. Um, hey, we've got John Carlos. You know, he speaks Spanish, Portuguese. He's also an underwriter, super detailed. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, maybe Toya does, you know, whatever her strong suits are. Alejandra, her strong suits, right? So now you guys are just really just taking over that whole area as a group. Because if I pushed you with one finger, yeah, it may hurt. But if I close my fist and hit you with all fingers, you're going to get knocked out. So that's, you know, teamwork is always going to make the dream work, my friend. So maybe you want to re-talk to Alejandra and try to sell that because I'm telling you, I think you guys could do a lot more business together, um, especially with your mindset. And I'm loving your mindset, uh, by the way, my friend. Very very good. Thank you, Walter. You're totally right on that. I will definitely share with them. Sir. So let me ask you, um, the two realtors that you're currently partnered with, how did you meet them? Um, was it cold calling? Are they in this uh, area? Uh, was it through church? Like, how, how did you meet them? So the first one, I knew him from Wells Fargo. Uh, he was, uh, he w- used to be a, a processor manager. And I used to be the underwriter who will kick all his loans back to him. So he didn't like me. <laughs> but he didn't like me, but he knew that I was really good on my, at my job. And he knew that I was really detail-oriented. Mm-hmm. And so he always knew that about me. So one day I reached out to him and he, he was asking me, so, you know, about, you know, this... Uh, this new world in the broker world, how long I've been on a lot of, you know, I moved from West Fargo in November. And he, at the beginning, he was having some doubts. He told me, you know, okay, well, but you just come on board and say, David, I've been an underwriter and you know, my work ethic, you know, how detailed I am. I promise you on every file you send me, I'm going to put my heart and soul and I not have the knowledge. There is absolutely no way that I'm not going to do a good job on your file. So he sent me the first one, clear, easy, full communication, full detail oriented. You know, the borrowers love me. They still love me. We close. Perfect. Nice. And then now he sends me everything. <laughs> so there you go. He sent me another one and we close as well. And, and, and that's been, that has been the case with him. So he's, I'm his preferred, let's I don't want to say I'm his preferred lender, but he trusts me with his files and he knows he can send me English, Spanish, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, he loves that stuff about me. Um, with the second one, the second one was 
this agent called me one time and she was, uh, you know what, I've been talking to a lot of LOs and she's, it was a newer agent back then in December. And she was telling me that nobody returned her calls, like nobody wants it to, because she keeps sending her, sending the other LOs like really bad files. So there was a point where the other LOs didn't return her calls anymore. And, you know, they didn't wow. care about her anymore. So I say, no worries. Uh, I'll definitely, will work together. I schedule a couple, two or three meetings with her. I train her. I show her what are the, the pillars of the mortgage transaction. Uh, and I told her, I'm going to be available for you anytime. Just send me everything you got and I'm going to be available. And I was always on the phone. I mean, sometimes she will have a customer, you know, on a Sunday, I would answer my call. You know, even if, even if I was with the kids, I was always available, always helping her. She keeps sending me files that maybe are not that great. But and then I have one that we're about to close on Monday. And I have three prequels out for her that she's shopping. So I have three more contracts that might be coming in. And I'm constantly communicating, constantly training them, constantly, you know, supporting them on whatever they do. And and I took her out actually on Saturday on a realtor appreciation day, you know. Nice. Uh, I took her out for uh ice cream we went to the pearl which is a beautiful place here in san antonio just to show appreciation and we walk we talk and just like friends that's it um, that's so it. that was that's it well Dude, i love it I, I listen um man you you are going to be extremely successful you see here's the thing you have no idea how many new los i hear i don't want to talk with newer loan officer or uh, realtors. I don't, I, I you know, I want to deal with the middle of the pack and then work my way up. These people, you know, the people that have that type of mindset are not going to make it. Um, in this saturated market of loan originators and of course with realtors and less and less inventory, do what John Carlos is doing. He says, okay, you have a problem and you're sending bad people. You need education. Let me give you some... This new realtor is probably just happy to get somebody on the phone. And here you go, John Carlos, and isn't right now was in the hope business, right? Of which a lot of LOs are in. You guys are in the hope business. But what John Carlos said is, I see something that I can polish to be a diamond. So what can I do to serve you? How can I help you grow? And number one, you built trust there. Taking her for the uh, appreciation day, you're gaining trust there. And what does he always do at the end? He makes it a human experience, which builds strong relationships. I guarantee you, no matter how good that realtor becomes, you will always be at the top of her list for what you've done in the beginning. I love new realtors. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Come into Zoom. Let me show you exactly how I do a pre-qualification. Um, I'm actually thinking about holding some workshops for realtors on before they get a listing, the things to look for, how to identify red flags up front, especially if it's in a, like a lower income area and you know it's probably going to be an FHA type loan. Man, knowing that you need to get lead base paint, is this done? Um, a mandatory clause, right? Giving them those little key things in the beginning. Hey, look at that. Um, look at the awning. You know, that's going to be an issue. Oh, that's not painted. You got to get that painted. Helping them close earlier because they also look way better to their seller, right? The more knowledge they have, they can take it, and now they get more listings. Then you're the one who gave them the knowledge, and so you get more loans. You got to give, people. You got to give. And John Carlos, man, geez, John Carlos, I... I, you know, at the end, we're going to open to Q&A, but I think you got all the answers, my friend. You're doing all the right things. So I love it. I love it. Um, great stuff. Yeah. Um, and one thing I want you guys to, to do that's listening as well is remember, John Carlos was an underwriter of 13 years, but he still recognized he knew nothing about mortgages. And he's still learning about mortgages. I think that's another thing that, that stops uh, John Carlos' newer LOs. Um, we all have that, or maybe you guys haven't yet, but you will at some point in your career get that call from a realtor who's been a realtor for 25 years. And I know loans and blah, blah, blah. No, you don't. Okay. Um, I'm an underwriter. I know loans. Well, no, you may know how to structure, but you don't know how to talk to people. You don't know how to ask the proper questions to get it, get the real information out when you're taking an application. 
right? You know the, the structure of it, but you don't really know what it takes to actually do it. I know what an appraiser does. I can read an appraisal inside and out, but I still can't go to do an appraisal and do their cost approach. And I, I don't even know how, how they do all of that stuff, you know, because, and I've done loans for 25 years. So just know, no matter who you're speaking with in the industry, everyone has a lane. Sometimes they like to blend into yours, but it, you are the professional in your lane and don't allow that to happen. So just a little bit of advice out there for everyone. Um, now, let me ask you a quick question, and I don't know if you've asked this to your realtor partners, but I would suggest you do if you haven't. How do they generate business? I think what, what they have told me is that they uh, make phone calls. From, from um, what list? Like, where do they get leads from their brokerage? They, like, how? They, they they brokerage buy some trigger leads, I believe, and that's how they uh, generate their own leads. And they also do open houses and you know try to get the buyer uh, from there as well to become the buyer's agent. Um, those are the two things that they're currently doing. But it's a question that I haven't dig in too much. And that's a good thing that you're bringing it up, Walter, uh, because that's, that will be a, a great area to dig in a little more because I haven't really done it much at all. Yes, sir. Um, you know, uh, you've been a part of some of the classes that I teach, and I'm real big on the brain. And one thing that I know is the only way to gain information is by asking questions. So it sounds like you have a couple of trusted partners now, for those of the, you that are listening and you're working with realtors, ask them how they generate business. Ask them, oh, wow, you're calling trigger leads? Okay, what's your pitch? Have them role play. Role play with them. This is a perfect way of gaining trust. Um, you know, I would say offer to call them, but I, I, that you're now you're an employee. So if I'm doing your job, I'm, I work for you. And, and that's not a true partnership. A true partnership is coming together in role playing together, um, figuring out where they're getting leads, how many they're getting. And if you can think of ways of how you can double those leads and triple those leads, uh, amazing. Uh, John Carlos, you know, with your realtor, go to those open houses. See, that's great information. I think what happens is a lot of newer LOs know, yes, I got to go to open houses. But how many of you guys and, and ladies out there how many of you are going to open houses and actually talking to the people that show up to open houses? Because apparently there's realtors that go there. That's how they're that's how they're they're getting clients. They're going and they're saying, hey, you know, I'm a realtor. I can show you a whole bunch of more houses. Are you working with someone? They're doing exactly what you are doing. So, you know, I, I uh, one time I'll tell you this story. Um, I was, uh, I think, eight. No, I had just gotten to the broker world. So I think I was nine years into my career and I was doing the same thing. Open houses. Man, I, I used to call through the phone book. Uh, that's how old school I am. Get farm lists and just cold call. Right. And so I was at this open house and this realtor was slammed. I mean, there was like 40 people. So I didn't even ask. I just started showing people as if I was a realtor. And listen. You know, I just know how to live in a house. I don't know how to show it. You know, I know what a, a bedroom consists of, but I was just like, oh, and look at this, just brand new plumbing and doing all these things. And after like the four, the fifth person that I helped walk around the house and we talked, the realtor was noticing me. And at first they thought that I was like a a, a realtor trying to steal their business. And was uh, they're like, hey, can I talk to you? And I'm like, hey, what's going on? Who are you? Oh, I'm actually a newer loan originator. I just saw you were slammed. And so I just thought I'd just help you kind of show the house to people and answer some questions that realtor to this day I still work with because I went above and beyond I didn't step over my shoes uh, any type of pricing questions I always said hey you're gonna have to wait for the main realtor who's selling I'm really just trying to help you know with this but they were so thankful just for doing that so um you know, guys, go talk with everybody at an open house. Don't just assume they're there to buy because you never know. That could be your next partner just sitting right in front of you. Um, let's see here. So my next question, my friend, I want to now – we were having a discussion before the podcast, and so uh, I want to kind of bring that back. So we were talking about the new LLPAs, 
And what John Carlos was telling me is that he was part of this meeting today. And what they were discussing is, is that they're trying to bridge the gap between qualified borrowers, high credit assets, income to borrowers that have maybe less assets, lower credit score, and maybe a little bit more tighter income. And so my question to John Carlos after we had this brief discussion was, why do you think that banks are starting to do that now? And so we cut it off because I wanted to get this um, out for you guys to hear, but uh, go ahead, John Carlos. Why, why do you think um, that banks are doing this now? Well, definitely, I mean, they're following the adjustments, right, um, that I have been putting out there. Uh, but, but at the same time, I think what is behind those adjustments is I think there is this perception from some people on different spectrums uh, politically, right, that the pricing gap needed to be reduced, needed to be narrowed it down. So in that way, the person with a higher credit score and more assets doesn't get such a much better pricing than the person without a, with a, without a good credit score and without much assets. So I think in, in, in order to narrow that down, that gap that has been always very noticeable, you know, in our pricing engines, yep. they have come out with these adjustments on the LLPA. So, you know, I think if, you know, after listening to some economists and financial people in the news, um, I think people that are more on the left are saying that this is a good thing. And people that are more on the right are saying that this is unfair to people who have been responsible financially and with their credit overall. But at the same time, they're saying that is, you know, that this is, gonna, this is not gonna be as effective as they might think is going to be, right? Because, you know, FHA is always going to be a better option. So they, they don't see the benefit to the other side, to the to the lower credit, lower asset side of the spectrum. Yeah, and um, I always find this funny, um, how the media and uh, different outlets um, portray uh, they they literally make up the narrative and what happens to us is we fall into that narrative and now we make an opinion based off the information they're providing us uh take it from someone who was around during the 08 crash when banks fired everybody um nobody really cares uh about higher credit uh versus lower credit uh interest rate gap it's all about greed, my friend. See, if I, if I, right now, everybody knows, well, if you don't know, uh, you should know. Within some point at this year, uh, interest rates are going to drop. Okay, I can tell you that right now. Um, we're on the brink of the dollar being lost as the world, uh, the global 61% uh, of the world is ran by the U.S. dollar. China's trying to take that over. We've got banks um, not being managed correctly. Um, and with the higher, as the Fed keeps raising the rate, um, these banks aren't hedging their money correctly and they're losing out on tons of money and they're going to be closing doors. Um, the government is saying, hey, listen, we're not going to come in and save these people. Uh, but of course, they're going to coming in and saving the people. Um, because every single penny they use is ours. So what's happening here is greed. Because they see they had a they had a good run, right? They gave us the, the good run on low rates for years. Then they had a short period of time to get a bunch of money on their books at way higher interest rates to make way more money. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to restart to bring in more people by covering those gap differences. So that person that would at a 640 credit would have been getting a seven and a half percent interest rate and in paying points, right? Now, what they're going to do is they're going to say, "Hey, listen, we're going to give you a seven and a quarter, uh, and maybe only pay half of a point. Come, come on in, because they don't really care about the money they're making up front. They care about the servicing of the loan. And everyone knows, and if you don't know, um, you must make six on-time payments." And then you can refi. If your client does, then you have what's called an EPO. 
So all the banks are trying to do is bring in more people to come in so that they can make more money at higher interest rates while the getting is still good. That's what it boils down to. It's always going to be boiled down to greed. And I learned that lesson uh, in 2008 of how they actually care about you, how they care about me, uh, and they don't. Uh, we're, we're a dollar sign. We're a number. And how can we get more money out of you? And these are those little tricks. Absolutely, Walter. I don't so, agree with your take. Yeah. Now, listen, I, I love America, though. I want everyone to know. I love America, um, home of the free. And listen, um, only in America can you literally, if you've got the right mindset, like my friend John Carlos does here, um, you can do whatever you want, right? You can go learn any language. You can go anywhere you want. You can go get a master's degree. Um, you can go get realtors being brand new. You can do whatever you want. And in our country, we are allotted that opportunity. So I love America. But let's just be honest. We are still based off of greed. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, get your peace, my friends. Get your peace. Um, so, um, well, listen, I think this has been amazing, man. A lot of great insights. Um, I do want to open it up. Do you have any questions for me? Anything that I may be able to help you out with? Um, you know, anything. Um, feel free to ask, and I'm, I'm here to help, my friend. Well, I, I always wanted to ask you, Walter, how do I come from being an average producer to become to a massive producer like you? This is very simple. You're on the right path. Um, every single answer that you gave me was 100% true. Your mindset is there. Your perspective is there. You're putting in the work. Um, I've already given you the idea. You really need to talk to Alejandra. Um, and whoever runs that office over there that you're that you guys have that, in that hub, and I'm telling you, man, um, one finger is strong, but a fist you can punch through a wall. And if you guys get together, figure out what your strong suits are. Um, figure out maybe even it's a roundtable type deal, right? Um, how many offices are around your one office? Um, there are a lot of title offices, but there are not that many lenders. Oh, title's even better. Yeah. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Um, go to those title offices. Um, I could tell you at any title office or any real estate office, the person who holds the key is that front desk, either man or woman. Yes. So what you need to do, take them donuts once a week. Yep. They have a database for realtors. <laughs> and they can I, do the classes. A hundred percent. Um let me tell you a story about a, a gentleman. I won't drop his name here, but it was a very impactful story. Um, what he did was he knew that title was a huge opportunity of gaining business through realtors because especially listing agents, they all have their go-to title, right? And this was a big title office. So what this person did was every week they would stop by Friday and bring donuts and talk five minutes with the front desk person. An organic relationship. Oh, you're looking good today. Uh, well, you got any plans for the weekend? What are you and the hub you going to do? Okay, cool. Well, listen, I'm just coming by to give you my donuts. I'll see you next week. We don't have to. I know I don't have to, but I'm going to bring you donuts every week. So next week, brought donuts. Next week. Now, listen, just like in anything in life, you are not in control of the time of when it's going to hit. You just need to be ready when it does. All we can do is control the positive uh, movements that we do and great things will come, okay? And you don't know when it's gonna happen. So in this case, this person came uh, two and a half months of bringing donuts, no deals, not even ask for business, nothing. Uh, a realtor was having an issue with the lender. And so title said, oh, well, you know, this guy, I've been actually talking to him, he comes to the office, he seems real nice. I, I think he's strong, why don't you give him a shot? He got that loan from that realtor and knocked it out. Guess who that realtor ended up becoming? The number one, they, in Arizona, they started the first office for Redfin. And wow. that person then became the number one go-to lender for Redfin, Arizona. Made a whole wow. career off of going to a title office and giving donuts and three to five minute organic conversation. You see, this is what we got to erase. Don't have any judgment. Just like you, John Carlos, your, your girl, 
one officers weren't even calling this poor realtor back, and they're like, and I bet you those same LOs are like, how come I can't get any business? You had business right in front of you. You just didn't think outside the box and teach them. Give them more knowledge. Why are they bringing you crap deals? If they're bringing you crap deals, that's because they don't know. And John Carlos was smart enough. 100%, man, you bring them in. You have a couple conversations. Hey, here's what we look for for a prequel. Maybe you should start asking your buyers these types of questions. So up front, you can kind of pre-make sure that they're going to be good for you to go. Do they have any money saved? Are they looking for seller concessions? Have you worked at the same place the last two years? Do you happen to keep a look on your credit score? Do you pay your bills, right? I mean, these are basic questions, but see, remember, like we discussed earlier, realtors don't know what they don't know. So if they don't know that it's debt to income ratio, loan to values, assets, reserves, um, all of these great things, how can they know how to talk to other people? So my friend, I'll tell you, if you wanna make it to the top, just keep doing what you're doing. Lean on um, the office. And you know what? Now that I heard its title, I, I don't want you to lean on anyone. I want you to do what this person did. Start going in there. Just take them donuts once a week, every Friday. Make it the same day, right? And a Friday is a good day because we made it through the week. We all know title companies are crazy busy, right? Um, Fridays are perfect days because they're like, thank God it's Friday. I'm about to get out of here. That's the perfect opportunity to come in with a gift. Hey, listen, here, just wanted to bring you guys donuts and talk and um, have a, just an organic conversation, but do it every week. You know, a $30 investment every Friday, it's 120 bucks a month, man, that could give you thousands and tens of thousands of dollars of, of working with people. So um, you need to start doing that, my friend. Um, and then here's the thing. The other thing I will tell you is I love what you're doing with this newer realtor but you need to lean on the realtors that are using you so that you get more realtors. So I want my guy, David. Hey, David, have I not been doing a great job by you? Yes, you have. Okay, I want. I need to work with at least two people in your office. Can you make that happen? Don't be afraid to set a proper expectation to that realtor, okay? Um, your, your other realtor, she's newer. Hey, are you in, ask her questions like we talked. Are you in any groups that, how do you navigate the real estate world? Um, how many open, like, uh, I'm sorry, how many happy hours do you go to? Can I go with you? Is there any newer, um, are there any newer realtors in your office that are having the same issues you were having that maybe I can help them with, right? I mean, you should be able to get, just from this one realtor, at least two to three new people. Bring them in. You know, everyone doesn't know this, but Zoom, you don't actually have to pay for it. If you just have a login, they give you 30, 45 minutes for free at a time. Bring them in. Ha show yourself on camera. Um, use the whiteboard. Show them different steps on how to do a pre-qualification. Give them a list of questions to ask so they're also not spending their time. Show them value. And I promise you, you at the, by the end of the day, um, especially if, if you're on it like John Carlos, you could literally have a team of five to 10 newer realtors that are constantly working with you because you've already given them value and you've already set up that partnership. And then your one seasoned um, realtor, he should be getting you at least two. And then you do the same thing with those other two. You come in and kill it. Hey, I need two more. And I need two more. And, and don't be afraid to set those expectations because John Carlos, you are worth it. You, you are an underwriter. You're extremely detailed. You make sure they're not going to waste their time. You communicate. You do all of the things that they, that they want. And also, if you don't know what a realtor wants, ask them, hey, what, let me tell you, how come you're not working with someone? Oh, because this and that. And if, if I could be the perfect loan originator for you, what could I provide to you for service? Tell me exactly what expectations you're looking for from me. I promise you they'll give them to you. And then at that point, you just do that. And then once you do and they're on the team, hey, I need you to go get me another realtor. Make them work for you. But you're going to make it, my friend. You, you 100%. I tell you, I've been in this industry a long time. Uh, out of newer people, you are someone who is taking the bull by the horns. I love what you're doing. You keep it up. And you got my number and email. Anytime you're going through an objection or anything, you know you come reach out to me. I got your back, my friend.
Thank you, Walter. Appreciate you for the opportunity. Of of course, man. Of course. Well, listen, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, you've been a great interview. I hope you had a good time. Um, good information, especially for those that are listening. Um, and yeah, we'll definitely get you back on here in the next couple of months. I want to, I want you to take the things we talked about again, go to those title um, companies, get Asher Realtors for more business. And I want to bring you in and I, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Do those steps and we'll see what happens, my friend. Absolutely. We'll follow up on that, Walter. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate your time, John Carlos. And, uh, you know, say goodbye to everyone, my friend. Thank you. Bye, Walter. Bye, everybody. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button below. And for more daily knowledge and content across all social media platforms, feel free to follow me. If you're also interested in being on the podcast, feel free to send your information. You can visit my website and a team member will reach out to you today. Until next time, my friends, stay hungry.